Okay, guys, so here's the deal. I started this podcast to bring you deeper inside the process behind making films and shooting photographs. It's been my goal to give you the fuel you need to keep pressing on through those slow months, through that long wait for your projects to be finally finished. All I've ever wanted is to help light that fire that burns bright and becomes the beacon for your creativity. <laughs> All that being said, selfishly, I've really been looking for a reason to have exciting talks like this one. This episode is the reason why I started this podcast. It's the reason why we do all this shit for free. Today, we talk about my favorite aspect of photography and film, hands down. Today, we go deep into the process of lighting. Joining me are professional gaffer and film nerd Josh Dreyfus and all-around lighting guru Ruben Alves. We've set up a few tables in the center of a large soundstage at Red Sky Studios in Boston, and we're cracking open a few IPAs with the hope that they will lubricate the conversation that I always wanted to hear. The stuff I can never seem to find an American cinematographer. How can you use light to tell a story? Now, these two guys have worked with some of the greatest creatives in our industry, and they have designed the light for projects both big and small. So seriously, guys, I can't express how excited I am about this one. So grab yourself a beer, put on those noise-canceling headphones, sit back, relax, and enjoy the new episode of In Love With The Process. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the new episode of In Love With The Process. Uh, this show is an exciting one for me because we get to dig deep into one of, if not my favorite aspects of film and video, uh, and that is lighting. Uh, we will discuss some technical things like, uh, you know, what is a gaffer? Uh, does a key grip just hold everybody's car keys? Uh, and I'm sure we'll get nerdy about gear. But for me, I really want this conversation to go bigger into the meaning behind light, the power that light has over character, and how it can create depth and tone. On today's episode, I got two really uh, special guests. Uh, first is uh, Ruben Alves. Uh, he is the studio production manager here at Red Sky. Uh, Ruben has also worked on sets with me and designed lighting for projects for like the Polly Cook piece that we did and the Bose Better Sound Sessions. Um, and I actually met you when you were working back in the studio just repairing lights and doing stuff. Mm. Um, so you're kind of like a, a light genius, sort of like <laughs> a repairing genius. Uh, one of my favorite dudes in the city, say hello. Hello. Genius is a strong word. I would not use that in regards to what I do by any standard. He apparently has a lot of self-confidence, which is good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, also with us is um, uh, my buddy Josh Dreyfus. Uh, he is a professional gaffer and lighting technician. Uh, and from what I've heard, you're an all-around lighting nerd, apparently. That is accurate. That is good, that is accurate. <laughs> uh, so Josh has been working on major Hollywood productions since like, from what I saw online, since about 2005? Uh, in different capacities, yes. The, okay. At the earliest, it was 1995, but in terms of union productions regularly, yes. About 2000. Sure. 2005. Yeah, okay. That sounds good. <laughs> it's a Google search solves everything these days. Yep. Um, so I'm just going to take a minute. I'm going to rattle through some of the films that you've worked on so our audience has an idea. Oh, God. Here we go. Uh, so you've worked on films like Patriot Day. It uh, looks like Lost City of Z, Ghostbusters, the new one, uh, Joy, Spotlight, Equalizer, uh, American Hustle, The Heat, and many more. And you've been a gaffer on films like Manchester by the Sea, uh, Sea of Trees, The Forger, and then the upcoming Scott Free film, The Burning Woman, correct? Correct. Okay, cool. I'm so glad to have you both on the show. Um, I think uh, you both will help uh, give a little insight to folks that are just starting to think about light. Um, and to start things off, oh, also, I forgot about you. Dave is here as well. I'm no longer a special guest. <laughs> <laughs> You're just a regular. Do you even need an introduction these days? I don't think so. Uh, no. Mm -hmm. We had a whole episode about you. We were fine. All right. So, should I, should I listen to that one first? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, you would know the, the innocent. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit! Sorry, guys. Okay. So, um, let me stop at the. Let me start at the top here. Um, just to give some listeners that are worried, like, I don't know shit about lighting, so this is going to get techy, and I'm not going to be able to keep up. So I just want to um, ask a couple of questions. And to you, Josh, let's start there. So you're listed as working as an electric and a gaffer. Mm -hmm. um, what is a gaffer? Like, what is that job? Uh, so there's 
generally speaking, one gaffer on every motion picture production, depending on the size of the picture. And the gaffer is the chief set lighting technician who works uh, for the cinematographer and with the key grip to um, plan and execute the uh, lighting necessary for the cinematography. So does that mean that you're... Should I do that again? Or no, that's fantastic. Okay. So does that mean that you're in a managerial position or is it a hands-on position? Uh, that's a very good question. I think it depends a great deal uh, on the kind of production, the personality of the cinematographer, the personality of the gaffer themselves, um, how much, how hands-on they are or how strictly managerial they are. Um, so the department is also also consists of a, a best boy, the sort of second in command. And um, oftentimes it's actually the best boy who's taking some kind of a mandate from the gaffer to um, staff and equip the job according to the um, desires of the cinematographer. Mm -hmm. So the, the gaffer is in many ways sort of translating uh, aesthetic, ethereal notions sometimes, and sometimes more specific ideas into what do we need on a truck to execute a lighting plan. Okay, that makes sense. And then, so then the other position that you've worked on, and I think you've also done this position, you might be able to answer me. What is an electric? What does an electric do? Ruben. <clears throat> an electric works for the gaffer on the electric team. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how specific you want to get. No, uh, I mean, so, get a little specific. I mean, they're like thirds. Um, well, here's the deal. When you're watching credits, and I think the only reason why most people watch credits these days is during a Marvel movie and they're hoping to catch a glimpse of whatever fucking end scene that they have. For right sure. The you know, so you're sitting through this lineup, especially in the lighting department, where you see like Gaffer, Key Grip, Electrics. And um, I think a lot of that is just foreign language to folks. They just don't understand tangibly what those job positions mean. So if you're hired to be an electric, what are you? what is that position? So an electric works on set to sort of be the hands of the gaffer. Um, and uh, there are a few different set electric positions. There are also rigging electric positions. Um, they all sort of work under the best boy. The best boy sort of manages everybody, and then the gaffer sort of has the vision that they are executing on set. Um, there are also generator operators. There are different base camp electrics. Um, depending on what the production entails, uh, the position sort of varies. Mm -hmm. um, what? Yeah, and what country? I don't have much right. experience outside of the U.S. But right, there's a European system and an American system oh, fascinating. for lighting. Oh, cool. Yeah, so I mean, in the U.S., essentially an electric is somebody who works on set and manages all of the power uh, and the lights themselves. Does It does lighting that is uh, that requires electricity, whereas mm -hmm. the grip department does lighting that does not require electricity. Now, that's fascinating. That's my next question. So then, uh, basically, you... I sort of equate it to building an army. So whenever you do sort of a production like this, you're sort of looking for your generals, you're looking for your keys, is what they call it. Mm -hmm. And then you just are building your teams of people, and depending upon the scale of the production and how big it is, it's how big your, your groups are. Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> in the lighting department, so if as a producer of a film and then a director of a film, your keys as a director are like your DP, your production designer, and then you sort of get in those different departments, and then it breaks down from a DP to a gaffer, and then you have your key grip, and then you have your, uh, like, is it is it gaffer and key grip that are just two, the two main positions on a Hollywood film that are underneath? Like, if you were branching it off, you know what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah, if you were doing a flow chart, that would be how it worked. On, on some movies, um, there would be a second unit gaffer potentially. Going on scouts, you would have a rigging gaffer involved, you would have a rigging grip involved, and largely they are they are working for the gaffer. And then rigging is basically uh, a team that goes in like the day before or weeks before and pre-rigs a set ahead of time, basically. Some of the bigger setups. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. So that makes sense. I'm just trying to break through these, these titles so that way when you're looking at a movie, you kind of have an idea of what the fuck the shit means. Um, okay, so then uh, let's talk about uh, like a key grip. So what is the difference between a gaffer and like a, a grip at that point? So the so the gaffer gets a lot of power, gets a lot of juice, 
but um, I feel like it's generally unfairly. I mean, movies truly look great, and this is the only time that I'm really going to compliment the key grip, but <laughs> movies only really look great because there is phenomenal gripping involved. There's phenomenal uh, cutting and shaping of light, removing of light, excess light, um, changing the quality of the light, um, or or passively returning light into a scene to affect the contrast. So, but for some reason, the gaffers have sort of that, the closest relationship to the cinematographer, um, because the gaffer carries or traditionally carried the light meter and seems to have always come from a little bit more of a camera background than the key grip mm -hmm. has come from. And the key grip's job actually is in support of the electrical lighting and it's also in support of the camera department. Right, right. That's Equal, right. It's equally important for the grip department to do those things. I remember, because I've been a, a, a DP for years uh, on a smaller scale, and I remember having my mind blown when I was much younger and I worked with a buddy of mine, Mike Henry, who's been a, um, a grip in town for quite some time. And when we were doing music videos back in the day, we went through the process. For me, as a young cinematographer, it was always like, okay, what lights am I using? How am I illuminating and how am I doing this sort of stuff? And then working with him was such an eye opener because he's like, okay, great. You've set these lights up. You've turned these lights on, but this is in real life. Like in real life, there aren't just lights blasting at people. Like how does that quality of light change things? Like how are you shaping that light? And then it, it's been this slow, I mean, I've been doing this stuff for like 18 years. It's been this slow sort of learning curve of like, oh, right, right. There's, there's this level of control that needs to happen. And then then... How do I take light that is coming from the most unnatural source possible, which is light, and make it feel like it exists in life? And how, how do we do that sort of stuff? And it was the conversation with a grip that actually taught me all those different things. So I completely agree with you that it's one of the more underrated positions and one of the more important positions. And a key grip can easily make or break the gaffer. Yes. Uh, in yeah. the background, we have our buddy Franz hanging out with us. He's yes. chiming in. And you can jump right on a mic anytime you want. Franz was saying the key grip can really make or break the gaffer because um, it's the capabilities of the key grip and the relationship between the gaffer and the key grip that um, is really sort of coalescing the vision of the cinematographer and creating the consistency, the cohesive approach of you know making the film. So you could have a uncooperative key grip or you could have a key grip with different priorities um you could have a key grip with a very different just aesthetic opinion um and it's just like any collaboration it's you yeah. want to feel like you guys have good chemistry yeah um and that that you're both serving the cinematographer um that you're both seeing hopefully the way the, the cinematographer wants to see and this is cool because I, I really want to transition now into this whole idea of ah, <clears throat> basically you're taking someone's vision. You're taking an idea that exists in somebody's brain. And this is the most difficult part of filmmaking, I think, in general, is that you come up with an idea and you sort of see it. And then you have to learn the technique of conveying what it is that you see and translating that to multiple levels of people which is very difficult. And I think, um, especially visually, when you're dealing with um, the camera department, and if, as a, as a director, I would turn to my DP and, and I would spend weeks with him, just sort of like watching movies and going on dates, basically, having beers and sort of really sort of getting aligned with the language together and sort of the vision together. And then he has his own sense of what I'm explaining to him, and then he's bringing his own life sort of uh, experiences into how he lights things um, and then he has to do the same thing with you guys which is interesting so if from a directorial standpoint you guys are like two steps down or two or three steps down do you guys still feel like you have on a gaffer's level are your hands still in creatively or are you just sort of pulling things off technically uh, that, that depends on style that depends on the chemistry between the gaffer and the cinematographer uh, the, the, I mean, inevitably the gaffer has to be creative and has to sort of be thinking on their toes, sort of to be improvising, 
to be anticipating, to be sort of understanding how the actors um, are in a relative position to the camera and how the actors and the camera are in a relative position to the light. And does that work in a static shot? Is that, how does that work in a dynamic shot? Mm-hmm. So, um, and then a lot of times cinematographers do give creative license to the gaffer or there's opportunities depending on the length of their relationship over the course of their career for the gaffer to um, improvise or say, this is, a, this is a recipe that I really like for this kind of color. This is a recipe that I really like for uh, this quality of light. And the cinematographer could be totally on the same page with that. And then, yes. But there are other times when it's strictly a technical execution, Mm -hmm. which can still be our our gargantuan task, for sure. Yeah, yeah. But it's interesting that you use that that term recipe, because I think, at least for me, I see light and I, Ruben, you and I have talked about this before. I see light as, as actually a fluid, which is very strange. Like I actually see it as like this living fluid that as you turn it on, it splashes over things and it reflects over things and how it sort of lays out in that. And I'm, I'm constantly looking for a way to, to make sure that the light that is used conveys something emotionally. It helps transport you into a space because it's one of the more magical elements and physically magical elements. I mean, there's CGI and there's all this sort of baloney that that exists beyond that for camera tricks. But with lighting and constant lighting specifically, especially if you're using like a hazer or a smoke machine, you get the volumetrics and you have all that sort of stuff. You can physically turn on these units and then transport yourself into a whole other universe and a whole other world. Um, And so my question would be this, like, is it from a gaffer's perspective are you just are you trying to convey those elements of emotion through the practice that you've had or are you just in a position where it's like hey this is what i need to do and these are the units that i need to do it with and i'm sort of shopping for those units you know what i mean i do so i think what you're talking about is something that uh hopefully the cinematographer is holding this like truth this idea Mm -hmm. they've received it from the director and I think that a great deal of really uh, successful successful gaffers um, know how to take that that bit of truth and um, and translate it and there's varying degrees to which that will be like a very concrete thing and then that will be sort of an abstract surreal thing so but over the course of our careers, like when a- after we've, you know, had children and mortgages, and <laughs> we've worked for so many years, and different different people hold on to sort of that that magic, like interpreting that truth, mm-hmm. like whatever's in that screenplay or whatever's in that idea, this sort of um, unnameable essence that you're trying to pull out of the story that's in someone else's head and then execute into reality. I, I think a lot of people do lose that. Like a lot of people do kind of get bitter and jaded and they walk onto a set. They know because there's conventions that the light should be here. Yep. Or we've been shooting it this way for so many hours or so many days or so many weeks and this is what we're going to do. And they follow a formula, you know, and maybe there's not a lot of thought in it anymore at that point yeah um but there are there are those there are those lucky few maybe they're not that few but who who still feel some magic some interpretation of what sort of the truth emotional truth of the script is and how that translates into lighting do you think that magic starts at the top like do you think like if the production starts is it is it the tone that is set by the people that are running the production that will yeah, I mean, even if you're working for, for somebody who has a great resume and you show up on the first day and you realize they're kind of calling it in, they're just kind of phoning it in, Yeah. then yeah, that sets the tone. Um, you have sort of a, you're sort of a subject to actors' schedules and all of these things. I mean, that's real life. That's stuff that we do have to deal with and our logistics have to work within the real world. So yes, there's only so many hours in the day. There's only so many days in a production schedule. Yep. You know, they don't just sort of run indefinitely when they're greenlit. I mean, they know this is a 62-day schedule. You know, 
Um, big movies can afford to go over a little bit. Little movies can't. They have to compromise. Um, but yes, I mean, you can work for someone that you even anticipated had a great deal of emotional connection or artistic expression in their previous work. And you can show up and you can just kind of feel like, wow, this is just really straightforward, conventional shit. <laughs> this a lot of that has to do with the content. A lot. Of the movie yeah, I mean, it all goes back to the script, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. any gaffer who's like been doing this for a really long time, I mean, they really try to sit down, I think, they really try to sit down and digest that script. And they are just like crossing their fingers and hoping that they like it. <laughs> Seriously, that it speaks to them, that they think that it's good. Um, because if they don't, they still have to go to work the next day and kind of pretend that they do. That's fascinating, too. Because then, especially on the bigger productions, you feel like it, it can very easily just become a job. You feel like it very easily can... I mean, you, you're in the union and you're sort of doing the paces and, you know, dependent upon egos and dependent upon who's on top of you, you know. Uh, it ends up just becoming a gig, but it's fascinating that, and it, you're not the only person that has said that to me. I've talked to a lot of my friends that do all that stuff and they read that script and they're still looking for that connection. They're looking for that um, spark that's there. And there's a there's a level of, I think it's only in this business because before I did this business, I was like a car mechanic for years and an airplane mechanic and a house painter. And, and a lot of that same sort of crew camaraderie and that sort of crew workmanship sort of translates to this job. But it's a very, it's a very amazing business because I feel like it, it still has that romance behind it. And I think with that romance, there's the promise of making something amazing. There's a promise of making something better. There's this promise of doing that thing that at, when you were 15 years old and you went to the movies and you saw like Bruce Willis like hanging off the side of a building with a fucking like, you know, <laughs> and he's trying to kick his way in. I mean, it's one of the reasons why, you know, you're in this business and I, it's 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 nice to hear actually it's really nice to hear that even down on the technician level that the, it really comes down to the script and it really comes down to the vision you yeah. know what i mean absolutely i mean uh i've been married for uh, a short time now and but my wife my wife and i when we were dating we actually uh, started to walk out of films huh for the first time in my entire life, like I used to just have this voracious appetite for film and I would sit through everything. And I was so excited when I saw a trailer that looked amazing and it was shot by a cinematographer that I thought was just God, basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, you get you get older and you realize time is going by <laughs> and wow, this movie looks good, but like the story is shit. And yeah. I would rather be having a conversation with this person over a drink than sitting here for another two hours. Honestly. Uh, huh. Honestly. Yeah, yeah. So, How many movies have you done that you've walked out on that you did? How many movies have <laughs> I done I that I haven't seen? Yeah. Because Not the, interested. I wasn't interested. <laughs> wow. Oh, that's heartbreaking. Yeah. But despite all of that, <laughs> to still approach every job with an enthusiasm that, yeah, we're going to be making this thing that that dreams are made of, that distraction, um, not distraction, that dreams are made of that um, distracts us from our, the quotidian, our everyday events, you yeah, know? Yeah, that's the idea, um, right? that, that movies are all about. Yeah. Um, or that when we were really little, like, just left us in awe. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's for sure. That's why you, I mean, making movies is miserable. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, straight through, like the whole pitch process and the selling process and the dealing with people and dealing with egos and the fucking sitting around and fucking years and years and years and years of waiting to get to that point. And then you get to that point and then you have some asshole that's behind you that's got the money in his hands going, you're not allowed to do what you know you're supposed to do, so do it this way. So it's a fucking miserable lifestyle <laughs> and, and it's really hard not to lose sight of that. And I think... The people that last longest, and I think the people that do the most amazing work, somehow still have figured out how to hold on to that spark. And still have, I mean, it's, it's really nice for me to hear that because I feel I have worked with a lot of people that over the years I've seen that spark die. And it's one of the saddest fucking things to watch have happen. Yeah. Um, and it, it, I always get really freaked out when I have my key crew people that I work with all the time that go and work for another like, producer. I had a producer call me once and ask after we had done 12 cam if they could work 
with my team and I could suggest the team and I literally said to the guy, please do not fuck it up. Like, do not fuck this up. Like, do not kill the passion that these people have and, and, and the stuff by making a really shitty fucking production because I feel like one bad film can just salt everything. You know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's nice to hear that that at least you're still pushing through with that and you're still in yeah. love with yeah. all that sort of stuff. But I also have a lot of respect for, you know, my uh, my brothers and sister technicians who um, are just really good craftspeople. Yeah. And they are, they're just there to, um, to make a living, to get the job done. They're really good at what they do. They bring a lot of experience to it, a lot of perspective to it. And they can bring good attitude to it. But they don't necessarily have the sort of romantic sentimental connection to cinema yeah, yeah. That, that we're kind of talking yeah, about. And it's, I mean, that's understandable too. And I don't want to give off the vibe that that's exactly what you need to be able to do this right. I think that, I mean, for me, and the reason why the show's called In Love With The Process is that the process is most of your life. And for me, when I'm making my projects, it's not about the end goal. Like, of course, we all have this great idea in mind and we all have this great thing, but if the only reason why you're fucking doing this shit is to stand there in front of an audience and go, see, I told you, then that literally lasts for like a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months if you're hot and you're doing something great, but then it's gone and it's all fucking gone. And everything that you've been working really hard for at this point gets digested in about three seconds on a phone and it's done. And so you really have to be in love with every little step. And part of that process, if you are designing a film or you are creating a production, you're putting together a family, you're putting together a group of people that you're going to be working with every day, you're always starting a business. And so at that point, you want to make sure that you're creating that atmosphere that's really good and really exciting for people. Is that weird? You're giving me this look like... <laughs> no. I'm just checking in with my CIA minder over here. <laughs> I'm relieved I'm making you nervous. <laughs> do you want a beer <laughs> well so all, all that being said how important is like the camaraderie between the people that you work with oh creatively and personality wise so. it's not important at all <laughs> no I'm just kidding it's huge it's huge uh, I mean w most people who work in this business are used to and desire the dynamic of a job that has a beginning and an end. Huh. And I think, maybe I'm speaking out of turn, um, a job that has very specific challenges and goals that are, that are particular to that job. And the ability to come together with a bunch of collaborators and walk away at the end and then on the next job, come together again. And hopefully you're coming back together again like the circus is coming back to town and you're all happy to see each other. Yeah. Because it could be shitty again. It yeah. could be horribly long hours and really short turnarounds. And y yeah, you want to have a camaraderie. You, even, if it's, even if there's not a lot of time to be social, it's just like the shorthand between two people. You want it to be warm. You want it to be efficient. You want it to be receptive you don't want to say something to your key grip and uh for them to look at you like you're you're crazy or even for them to look at you like you're asking for the moon mm -hmm. when you know yeah that this is going to be a lot of work but it's worth it this is going to be a lot of work but this is what the job is asking for requiring and the thing that's interesting about that is i think from a creator standpoint i actually want that because I, I believe that making, and we always get into this and you give me shit for it. I believe that making movies is like cooking food. <laughs> and I think that if you have a chef, if you have people that are cooking for you that are full of anxiety, they're full of fucking stress, it doesn't matter how amazing that dish look, it tastes like shit. And I think that when I talk to folks that have worked on these big movies and they will come to me and say whether or not the production was fun or whether or not it was a fucking nightmare, more often than not when they tell me it was a nightmare, I watch it on the big screen and I go, I know it was. Like I can feel that it was a nightmare by how that movie actually translates it to me. So it's like a very strange thing that happens uh, with film. I think that that energy is somehow captured from uh, set. And I think that translates into the performances. I think that translates into the overall quality. I think that translates into the vibe of a picture. Um, but anyway, we're, we're off on this tangent, which we've dived pretty deep into. But like Ruben, 
You started initially as a producer, correct? And you were producing your own films and doing your own stuff? Yeah, a long time ago. <laughs> and so then, how did you, what made you want to get into the lighting world? Uh, I'm not exactly sure, to be honest with you. I had an opportunity to work over at Red Sky. And uh, Red Sky is more, you know, in the reflection of everything you guys have been talking about so far is essentially the tools and some of the different pieces of equipment we utilize to sort of achieve all of those different uh, applications that you guys are describing. Um, at a place like Red Sky, you sort of have, you have access to all of these tools and toys to be able to achieve some of these looks you guys are talking about achieving. And I think um, there's a step in between where you know, the director of photography has this whole vision that they're trying to achieve, and it's sort of the gaffer's job to be aware of the perfect tools to be able to achieve some of these looks. And uh, that's sort of where we come in. Um, okay. You know, there, every sort of tool has a different application and purpose, and uh, we work with different gaffers in the industry to either design or set them up with exactly the right tool for the job. Okay, so this is fascinating, and this is a good transition. So let's get back into the lighting. So... Um, there are a hundred different ways to do a hundred different things. Did I do a good, hold on. Did I do a good job avoiding talking about my producer past? <laughs> <laughs> you should go into politics. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. So, um, lights and gear, there are like all these different sorts of lights. So rattle off for me, cause you work here, Ruben. Uh, what are the different types of lights that are usually fine on set? Uh, so, I mean, these days, um, it's a range, it, and it depends on the production. I, I, I always say that there's sort of a million ways to do the same thing. It just depends on uh, uh, the size of the production, the size of the budget, the amount of people that are managing these tools. Um, how much of a show you want to put on. Exactly, how much of a facade there is to put on. Um, motion pictures usually come to town and get pretty stacked up with a, a you know, a range of tools to accommodate a range of applications uh, so you know we'll set up anywhere between a 32 or a 48 foot tractor trailer uh, full of everything from quartz lighting that's you know your Ari kits and your Fresnels and your open faces all the way up to uh, 12 maybe 18k depending on what you're doing um, and then obviously there's HMI lighting which is you know mimics daylight and there are all sort of different fixtures to accommodate applications well, let's, let's, let's <laughs> talk about those fixtures okay a lot of people don't know about the tools yeah I mean um, for anybody who's just getting started in lighting um, there are a couple basic exercises you can sort of do to see how light interacts with anything. You know, just take the lampshade off your lamp. <laughs> yeah. See what a light does in a room. Uh, see how the shadows are manipulated when you move the light around. Um, essentially, it's just all scaled version of that. You know, uh, every light just pours out a different amounts of light uh, in different directions and colors um, it just depends on what you're trying to do so HMI lighting specifically uh, is meant to mimic daylight color temperature so what's the deal with HMI lighting like why is it why is it why is it so close to the Sun and also when you look at it in certain situations and if you have a trained eye it's actually really blue as compared to anything else so how does HMI lighting actually work so, uh, you mean like the technical, like how yeah, does it actually work? Yeah, get fucking nerdy, brother. <laughs> Feel free to dive in. I mean, uh, yeah, so HMI lighting, the color of HMI lighting, uh, is created by the chemistry of the gas in a, in a lamp, in a bulb. Okay. And, uh, it's approximating, um, sunlight. It's to, to be clear, it's important. Sunlight, not daylight. Sunlight, because... A natural light source that we have to emulate is sunlight. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. So they could have they could have landed on another color. Um, once upon a time, there was basically two families of color film stock, oh, right. and one of them was balanced so that white looked white in sunlight, and the other one was balanced so that white looked white under tungsten or incandescent light. And then they actually they have a uh, actual number numeric value that goes with the with the uh, temp with the color temperature values, correct? So sure. Like, right. So sunlight is what like fifty five, is it or fifty six? Uh, yeah. That's a range forty eight to sixty five. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, and then uh, and that's tungsten 100 is, Kelvin. 100 Kelvin. And then tungsten is what, 3,600? 29 to 35 maybe, right? So when, Yeah, 20, I mean. Uh, these well, days is about two. Yeah, I two mean. Two to three. I, I've never really thought of it. it. Everything is a range, actually. But yeah. when it was a film stock, it was a very precise it was number. 32. Yeah, it was 32 and it was 56 or 55. And then, and then just, if you're yeah. walking around with a color meter at that point, if the lights are failing, you're just trying to correct those lights with some sort of correction or gels that are on those lights to get it as close to what that film stock wants it to be for white. Yeah, sure. The old way. I mean, the modern way now is that you have literally a white balance. You can dial in any specific, you know, Kelvin number that you want into it. So it's almost yeah. reversed at that point where yes. you're dealing with it at that level. But when they were designing those lights, it was specifically because of the film stocks that were designed to be white at 36 or white at 55 or whatever that was. Right. <clears throat> well, it was to emulate daylight. Got it. Which is our, our number one light source before fire, mm -hmm. before anything there was daylight. So that's that's the first, before color film, before color was even a thing, it's just the light source was the sun. Oh, interesting. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So then they made the film stocks, when they invented color film stocks, they made two different balances. Right, and that kind of blew my mind at one point. I remember when I was learning about this, when I was younger, I would just look at light and you wouldn't even process it. You're in a room and you go, okay, the light's on. You know, it's bright in here, it's not bright in here, it doesn't make a difference. And really it wasn't until I started to get into photography where I started to see the differences in color. And, the, and it, it blew my mind because then I was seeing that. It was such a weird transition where I was like, okay, so the inside light is generally warmer because it's tungsten lights, which is basically like a metal filament that's warming up and it glows amber color and it sort of gives off that amber color light and then you're dealing with the sun which somehow when I was in a warm environment the sun seemed more blue to me and then that blue color sort of came into play and then if as you even with fluorescence and fluorescence seemed a bit greener and then you have all these different color shades so so now you it seems like for tools you have this whole array of tools that will deal with those different aspects you know what I mean so you have like uh, Kina flows which are more fluorescent based and then you have your, um, uh, well, now LEDs is a big thing, and you can dial in any color temperature you want for well, LEDs. Well, yeah, I mean, beyond just the color spectrum of the light, it, it has more to, I think there is a, a little bit more consideration of what the light is meant to be doing in that scene. So a fluorescent okay. fixture will give you a much softer, uh, balanced light, um, whereas a Fresnel fixture gives you a harder light and it's more directional. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, you could have an LED uh, light that has a Fresnel on it and will give you a little more push, but traditionally LEDs are softer lights. Um, but yeah, again, every sort of tool has its consideration. You know, you might want something that is somewhere in between you know and you have to sort of create combinations of those and you also have to consider how you're going to affect how the grip involved with that setup will affect that light you know right. you might choose uh something a little harder like a fresnel but you might end up bouncing that into a scene if you want maybe the push to be a little bit more than a traditional soft source or whatever it may be you know um but again there are new tools coming out all the time that all sort of do um you know, similar things. They just have their own purpose. Um, it's sort of our job here to create the perfect tools for that application or to help sort of facilitate those tools for a production. Well, you used um, a lot of terms which I've been using for years and I know they're familiar to me and I don't know if they're as familiar to you, Dave, not knowing somebody. Well, I was just going to throw that out there. You talked about like a soft light versus a hard light. Um, so what, what's the purpose of lighting beyond, you know, like highlighting something because it's like a focal point for the viewer versus like the emotional purpose behind using a soft light or a hard light? Yeah, I mean, it all depends on what you're trying to achieve uh, in the image. Uh, some shots require a more dramatic tone and sometimes you do something a little harder. Something is a little more high key or a little bit more fun and you want nice, even light. So you'd have more of a soft light. Um, Again, the gaffer's job is sort of to um, 
help the director of photography create that vision that they've they have utilizing the tools that they have at their disposal and manipulating the light to sort of create that look for them so if like in one of mike's films you you might need to haze up the room and uh, blast uh some sort of fresnel fixture through a window with some straw gel on it or something um that might not be a typical application for that setup. Maybe people would typically use a, I don't know, an HMI for the window to mimic the sunlight or the daylight. Um, it sort of just depends on what the look is that the DP is trying mm-hmm. to achieve. Yeah, and I, I think, and I'll open this up to everybody. I think that um, really the hardest part when you're starting out, at least when I was starting out, the hardest part is sort of getting an idea of how the tools work. It's almost like back to cooking again. It's almost like trying to figure out, A, what the different flavors of the spices are before you're using them in a dish. And so when we talk about hard light and soft light, we're actually talking about the texture and the, um, I think it's the texture and the the intensity that the light has. And then how the light uh, will, how it translates into the darkness to a certain extent. Do you agree with me on that, Josh? Yeah, I mean, to me, uh, going back to the idea that the that daylight is sort of the the first light, the initial light source, it's important. I think when you're talking about what's a hard light for, what's a soft light for, what are all these tools for to go for a look, I think everything is relative to what is natural or like relative to what the real world is, yeah, right? Practical. So when you start like talking about um, making really hard shadows or really soft shadows, it's I'm in a space, we're photographing this space, we're trying to create a time of day or a feeling, we're trying to create um, a mood, but how would this space feel naturally? And then are we shifting that in one direction or another for stylistic approach? Mm -hmm. So like... You know, your your first rule or your first job as a gaffer, I think, is to just get exposure, just to like photographically or in terms of a video camera, just illuminate the scene. And it's very easy to do that in an unnatural way. So how do you do that being true to the space, whether it's like on location or it's something that's been built and designed and thought about in terms of the geometry and the color palette? And then... How do you work that towards like a visual language that's more than just being natural lighting? Yeah, right, right, right. And th- and then it really comes down to you having an understanding through your experience on what these different tools can emulate. And, and then whether it's a certain type of light or whether it's a certain type of diffusion that you're using on that light. Yeah. Like being able to say, and actually here's a good question. Is it, are you, did you find yourself sitting around and being in regular life and seeing the way the light sort of pulls through a window and then going, fuck, how does that happen? And then sort of examining that and then trying to recreate that. Is that part of the process for you? Yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> At a certain point, it probably started out that way. Yeah. And then you start seeing how light actually reacts with certain things and you start building off of that. Yeah. It's like a little. I mean, early on in my career, and um, I guess I was largely self-taught. Um, I would look at film noir. Yep. I would look at really sort of stylized things, so things that were that had a lot of geometry and a lot of con- contrast, really strong compositions. And I thought, oh, how, you know, how do I emulate that? So I was like thinking about how do I create a, like a stylized world. But after working on Hollywood productions for so many years, you start to realize that you actually need to really think a lot about how to make natural lighting work Hmm. in a way that is nuanced and simple and doesn't get in the way of the story, generally speaking, depending on the genre and the kind of picture it is. Like that is your bread and butter. And then when you're in an environment that's like a stage or a studio or you're in an environment which is a location and the sun is going down and suddenly you have to make it feel like the sun is going down for 12 hours straight and how does it feel that way? Then you start to think about, well, when the sun is going down, the shadows are hard potentially when they're coming through this window and the light is warm and it's just like looking and 
seeing mm -hmm. and reflecting on what you're seeing. No pun intended. Like anyone can just walk onto a onto a set and just say, "Oh, this light should be soft." Well, why is this? Is it cloudy out? <laughs> then okay then yes it should be soft like what is the script asking for totally. does the whole movie take place near the arctic circle and is the sun always low in the sky and All there, right. there are we... curveballs like yeah. every movie has a curveball yeah like you guys did lost city and we did uh the whatever that production was with the witches and stuff i don't know how you want to edit that but uh, <laughs> uh where you know that was mostly fire Right, everything yeah, was of in a lot of most of the practicals in that film were fire based. So yeah. we we're creating and creating new lights to sort of mimic the fire in a practical sense first, you know, and then seeing the limit of those lights, you know, it all sorts of sort of works together. Well, that's interesting too because I think generally, as an if you're doing a job correctly as an audience member, you're going, well, they just set up a fire, and literally you're just shooting these guys around a fire. But f specifically for that movie, what did you guys use? Like, what sort of technology did you use to recreate the fire? I mean, Ruben has a LED fixture here that has his name on it. <laughs> In terms of his construction, he took a manufacturer's LED product yeah. and he innovated a new approach. It was actually an approach so that we would be able to work with a low power consumption that would be able to um, either work strictly in a tungsten color or we could, for whatever reason, did you have hybrid ones too? Yeah. We could shift the color a little cooler, a little warmer. And then it would be really easy to make that light move and flicker totally. and dance. And it was a retrofit for a light that was an incandescent light source. Mm. Yeah. Well, for the f for one of the fire applications specifically, I remember um, we had to make a bunch of a bunch of Moroccan lanterns that looked like they actually had fire in them, oh, wow. uh, but we weren't able to use fire. So what we did was we created. Um, a bunch of little housings for some LEDs and then program them along with some sort of dimmer uh, that mimicked the effect of fire, um, but all, you know, high CRI, good color rating right. uh, in this, you know, still motion picture quality fixture made in these little Pier 1 looking Moroccan lanterns. See, that's so cool. That's the favorite part mm. about this business is that someone shows up with restrictions and they go, okay, look, we're out in the middle of the jungle somewhere. We have no generators. We have no nothing. So it has to have no power. So how do we do that? Right. And then it needs to be on screen. So it, we need to see that, you know, at some point it, that it, it looks like it has fire to it. Yeah. And then in those restrictions, you have talented folks that can come in and go, okay, well, I have these great ideas. I mean, like, where did you start? I mean, were you fucking around with the LED stuff before that? or? Yeah, I mean, with... <sighs> You know, at this <laughs> here, we sort of get random opportunities to work on really cool projects and with really uh, interesting and inspiring people who work in every facet of film. Um, every new project sort of has a new demand and you work with different personalities to try to create solutions for some of these demands. Um, with that project specifically, uh, we were just starting to really mess around with um, some of the different LED op options and manufacturers that are out there. And they were really attractive because LEDs produce a lot of light with relatively low power consumption. Right. So we were able, we sort of stocked up on a bunch of 12 volt batteries for one reason or another. And uh, we found ourselves working a lot more with these little tools that, you know, would run off a battery for three or four hours and would be motion picture quality tools you know like yeah, they were yeah. they were beautiful little light sources and they, there was a lot of flexibility with how you could utilize them so as a building block you know uh, that became sort of step one for m much bigger projects that we utilized you know everything from quasar leds to like gear leds to a bunch of off brands i mean diodes or diodes some of them in motion picture application have like higher color rating yeah um, and by color rating that means that they more consistent towards that color uh, more towards how they play with skin tones and uh how the the led i mean josh could probably speak a little more to this than i can but it, it has more to do with how they play with skin tones uh leds sometimes if they're low quality have a, a very metallic looking sort of they 
uh, they kind of look f- like green fleshy. I don't really yeah, know how to I, describe them. I would them. even say plasticky. Yeah. There's, they, there's color information that ends up being missing in the skin. Oh, got it. Or in whatever. Right, right, right. Um, but I would also, to sort of dovetail what you, what, what you were just saying and what we were talking about as far as LED, is to just point out that he was talking about putting an effect in a prop and... Um, Prior to that, when I was talking about his LED innovation, I was talking about putting an LED in a chimera, which might be used for a key light for an actor for a close-up. I know what a chimera is, is it's almost like a Chinese lantern. It's like a, like yes. a, a high, like a higher quality Chinese lantern. Yeah. It's like a soft box that usually has black sides and a, and a white face so that the light comes out in the direction that you want at a given quality. Yeah, yeah. It's funny we're both here because you were actually the inspiration for that light, and I just realized it while I was sitting here. <laughs> I don't know if you remember how we manufactured that thing, but at that time we were building a bunch of LED stuff in the shop, and I had just repaired an Arimax head, which is a you know an eighteen thousand watt HMI fixture, and it has this gigantic you know maybe two and a half foot reflector in it, and I had replaced the reflector because it had melted, and I had made I found like some sort of cylindrical object and I'd you know figured out a way to wrap it in LEDs and I was showing it off like oh man look at this light it's so it's so bright you know uh, and Josh is like well it's nice but it just like pours light everywhere like what are you going to do with it and I was like <laughs> I mean I don't know what I'm going to do with it I'll put it in the corner of the room we'll just fill it out so I was fixing that lamp and the reflector was just sitting there and I just put it in the reflector and I was like oh my god that's how we'll manipulate the light with this lamp and then the chimera was an obvious application because with the octobank specifically um, they bounce, they manipulate light really well and they give you a really nice soft well balanced look Yeah. Um, so that was just a sort of a no brainer was to combine the two but that's hilarious that you are the inspiration for that <laughs> I'm blushing. Um, But what I was going to say was, when you think about a movie like Lost City of Z, where we were employing LED flicker effects, we were also putting a great deal of pressure on the special effects department to provide real fire. Uh The gaffer, the rigging gaffer, and the cinematographer were saying to production, look, you're not figuring out a way to get a generator to get big lights down here, we're shooting on film, we're in the jungle, you know, something has to give. We need fire. Not only do we need fire, but we need haze, we need smoke, you yeah. know, because haze and smoke is a really great way to lower your contrast. So when the jungle is going dark, you run tubes of haze in the background, fog in the background, and it reflects the light. and it sort of gives you just a little bit of exposure. It gives you a little bit of depth. It creates that volume that you were talking about before. So does the cinematographer, does the chief set lighting technician have sort of the confidence to go to the production and say, look, I know logistically we cannot solve this problem the way we normally would conventionally, but you're going to have to spend 10 times as much money on propane and fire and the manpower in this other department because when you're looking at a wide shot at an epic shot and there's right. all, a little prop with LED in it or a chimera with LED in it is not lighting the scene. Exactly. It's fire. Exactly. It's practical. Wow, that's pretty cool. And who's who's the DP on that one? Um, Darius. Some guy, what was his name? Darius <laughs> Conte or something. Some French dude. Some dude. And for those of you at home who don't know, um, he's... Uh, I, I uh, my favorite uh, DP is for uh, my favorite film that he's ever done. I think still is Seven, the original, you know. And then he's done like City of Lost Children. I think he did On the Lay. A bunch of the Junior you know? Caro films, yeah. Yeah, I mean he's amazing. And now he actually refers to that light as the Ruben light, right? Uh, well, I think Franz incorrectly spells it on purpose just to not give me too much credit but they do use it on a bunch of those movies. Yeah. <laughs> he also shot the Michael Hanukkah film Amor. Oh yeah, shot, I guess you shot a couple of Hanukkah he's, films. Yeah, no, he's done a but bunch of. But that's like money. a that stylistically, that's in a completely Midnight different in Paris. direction. Really lovely, yeah. soft light. And so, what was it like working for him as a gaffer? Was it exciting? Uh, well, I was working for I was working uh, for Franz Wetterings, the gaffer, who brought me to Columbia. Um, it was exciting to work for Darius because I did come up 
looking at his films and responding to them in that magical way, just like being just blown over by yeah. how they looked visually. And, gen and generally speaking, they were also just really well-written, good movies. <laughs> yeah, it's very true. <laughs> um, but yeah, you, you go there, you're a little starstruck. And uh, it was good. He's great. Yeah. Super um, nice guy. I think he's used to getting a lot of resources yeah. um, to work with. And he has a very specific needs and specific approach that he would like to employ if there were no limitations. So when you go to the jungle <laughs> and you tell him, I'm sorry, we just cannot have, you know, six 18Ks every single day going through 20 by 20 frames of magic cloth because here's all the reasons, then it really pushes him to kind of go back and um, think about lighting, you know, in its sort of basic way. Mm -hmm. And for him, I think, and I think for the director, that's about positioning the actor and the camera relative to the sun. It's about positioning the actor and the camera relative to that fire. It's like rendering it very simply, but thinking about it, thinking about how that's... Very systematically. Yeah. yeah. That also comes back to blocking. At that point, totally. then that light unit becomes another one of, another piece of your talent that oh. you're ultimately just trying to figure out where you're blocking them and how you're blocking that sort of thing. Like, uh, 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 Jesus Christ, my brain just stopped. Um, Tree of Life director there. Terrence Malick. Uh, Terrence Malick is the, a genius when it comes to actually just specifically using sunlight and practical light and bouncing of sunlight and, and making sure that he stages all that stuff. And I also feel like uh, with a lot of the younger generation that's doing stuff now, there's been a big push, especially in the photography world, to go very window-based and practical light and sort of sunlight-based. Um, and there's a lot of beautiful imagery that comes from that, but I think the side effect of that is that there's a lot of fear when it comes to gear and it comes to that recreation of that sort of stuff and how do I emulate these these looks. So I remember the first time I did a shoot and it was a music video shoot and I think it was in this building and I, it was my first studio shoot as a DP and there was nothing more frightening than walking into a black room. You know what I mean? And it's like, okay, what do I turn on first? <laughs> like, where where does the source come from? Like, wh what happens? Like, how do I make this work? And it, it took me a long time to sort of figure out what my steps were to actually start to build something. And I'll ask you this question too. So if you walk into it. But, but I would just say, like, music video is such a sort of exciting, raw. Because you can do whatever the fuck you want. Yeah. Theory. yeah. Canvas yeah. to yeah. just yeah. be creative and literally walk into a a dark black space and yeah. say, if I turn on this one light, what does it mean? What does it mean? Or what is it going to do? What is it going to illuminate? What do I not want it to illuminate? I want it just to illuminate this one element. Maybe it's the singer. I don't want it to illuminate all the walls. Yeah. I only want it to illuminate the singer after it bounces off the floor. So it's uplighting them, you know, or I want it to be so soft that it feels like it's everywhere. Wherever the, the singer walks in the room, they're illuminated, but we can't really feel the direction of it. And at the same time, I can't really see into their eyes. Like their eyes are dark. They're just yeah. sort of like softly top. Like what are you, what are, it's like so. It's a cool. Music videos are just so much, so fun to just kind of. Yeah, and I saw you get passionate about that and it really does come down to, but there's a fear in that for me too, because then ultimately it isn't based on reality at any point. So you're like, okay, so how does this start? And like where, where does this start from? And for me, I ended up falling back on what I know about how it reacts with people. You know what I mean? So my first light always is how do I light whoever is in it? Like what is the first, what is the key light for that specific person? Let me turn that on and then walk that around and then figure out where that starts and then build backwards off of that unit, you know? I go the other way. Oh, cool. Tell me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, my first question is, is what does the world feel like? Um, is it all window lit? If it's all, if it's all window lit and it's all coming in from the side, then I can't necessarily justify, um, giving the actor like a really hard top light. Um, cause it's like, where does that come from? Right, right, right. Um, if the room is full of practicals, it's full of lamps or if there's neon or there's, um, 
broken shards of glass on the floor that are reflecting light back up, like I need to immediately acknowledge that. So it's like, what does the world look like? And then how do I find the actor's light? And then I, th and then I think it's important to sort of say, what are these rules or, mm -hmm. or motifs that I want to light the actor with? Mm -hmm. We're always going to silhouette this actor, this character, or we're always going to light them with all of this edge light. We're never going to actually light them directly. You know, um, this, th I should never see the reflection of a light in this person's eyes. I want their eyes to be black. Which is fascinating because then ultimately, what does that mean? Um, well, usually that's coming from the conversation with the cinematographer and the director. And the gaffer is s sort of subscribing to that and, but I mean, and building on that. But I mean, emotionally, what do you think that means when you can't see the light in somebody's eyes? Um, I mean, I think it just means that they're, they're dead or they're, yeah. they're emotionless or they're spiritless um, or they're hiding something. Yeah. Um, maybe suddenly we see the light in their eyes after they've gone through some transformation. Or maybe after something is revealed to them, or after they've fallen in love, or you know, um, what, when you sort of when you can't when you can't see the light in someone's eyes, um, maybe it's harder for you to sympathize or empathize with them, or maybe you're afraid of them. So there are all these little elements that can help develop character through the through position light. of the light. Yeah, and how, and how it's playing. Mm -hmm. And if you're seeing a light in someone's eyes, I mean, that's a point of light. Like that's like a high, that's like sort of a high frequency. Um, I guess I, I sometimes think of light more like sound. Maybe instead of thinking it more like a liquid, I think of it a lot like sound. Although I think li a liquid metaphor is, is also very strong and very good. I mean, I like thinking about the strength of water or the strength of a liquid and also the sort of gentleness of water and liquid and it has its own sound as well yeah yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah like points of light can have very sort of high frequencies and high notes and bounced light can just have sort of lower frequencies softer notes sort of more resonant feelings mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. this is the good stuff this is the good stuff mm -hmm. like this is ultimately you learn about the tools ultimately you hang out you figure out how this stuff works but these are the things that I feel like are the important storytelling options are that you have with light which is the thing that makes it less scary <laughs> ultimately like once you start to figure out how these tools work and you un understand how uh, a bounced source feels and you understand how to actually see something happen in real life and then attempt to translate that and then that one day that you have taken a light unit and a colored gel and you're bouncing it through a colored fabric and you're like holy shit this looks like the light on my porch back in you know 1985 like you've somehow taken a memory and made it into a formula yeah and then you take those formulas and you put them away in your bank basically so that way if i show up to you as a director and i go i want this to feel like very 1985 and you know like reminiscent of my dad and, and you're like oh i got these tricks in my fucking bag oh, boom, totally. boom, boom. you know what i mean you pull yeah, them no, for sure and then that's i mean that's and that's the way that i often work but then you can also look at a movie like eyes wide shut <laughs> which is about trust yeah and desire and darkness and identity and love and what else but the movie is full of warm practical lighting there are so many like little points of light which in any other movie is how we sort of create that sentimentality so kubrick is like playing these sort of opposite notes against each other to sort of really confuse the audience i think emotionally and mentally that's when you start dealing with master sense. chefs yeah man. <laughs> and uh he makes the audience comfortable uh, with the form, but not necessarily the content. Yeah, well, for yeah, sure. But, but you but, hit it right on the head with reinforcing practical sources. I mean, that's where any filmmaker should start. It isn't about reinventing the wheel. You walk into a space, you block it out, you feel where these practical sources are coming from, and you reinforce or take away. And I think that's the place to start. It isn't about just sticking random lights in random places and just utilizing whatever you have. It's like, start with what's there. 
and then see what you need. If there's a window, you might need a little more push out of the window. You know, if there's no windows, maybe you'll need a couple more practicals to replace some of the available light bulbs in the scene. And then you might need some fixtures to further reinforce those, whatever they may be, you know, those practical sources of light. I think that's what you're saying with just starting, start there. You know, any Mm -hmm. filmmaker who's just starting to mess around with lighting, start with what's available and reinforce it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, have an opinion about it. Mm -hmm. Sort of say like, I'm, lo- I'm, I'm looking at this element, this character, or this actor, and the production designer put this light here. I'm like, is it working? Is it working for me? Am I going to emulate the way that light is going? Or do I hate that? Just basically have an opinion. Does this work for me or not work for me? Hmm. Do I need to take this light hmm. and get it as far away as possible so that it just sort of out of focus glow in the background and sort of start over or do I want to base the entire lighting setup around whatever this little yeah, element is yeah is it motivated for the director does it have a you know you can get into the whole symbolism with anything on a set I mean that's the point it's sort of you're building an equation you know and that equation has some effect on the viewer mm-hmm. and you just start with what's available and either add or take away from that you know it's pretty straightforward it's fascinating to think about light for me as so connected to the story and the emotions and the themes um, but breaking it down to you know when you are first starting out is there like an order of operations like when you read a scene is there like a, a series of steps that you do to say okay you know I'm gonna pick what lights there first then place them then the color then uh, shaping the lights I think it depends it on very, the production too you know, yeah it's a pretty general question but yeah I would say that on most feature films, you are looking for information in the script that influences what your your lighting package will consist of, um, what makes sense. Mm-hmm. But you're not necessarily reading the script and saying, "This is how I'm going to light each scene." I mean, unless you're doing, you're sitting down with the director of photography and sort of working that out. But it it could be like. This whole movie takes place in office buildings and gas stations. In a car. <laughs> or in a car. So that's going to affect... What units you're picking up. What units I'm picking up. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, there's not going to be any daylight, or it's all fluorescent, mm-hmm. or I don't need to worry about color so much because... Gaffers sort like of build their repertoire, though. Like, I work, obviously, we work with a bunch of different gaffers here. You know, when you're working with one gaffer, you're sort of going to expect more of one particular type of light. But it, again, that sort of boils down to people utilizing the tools that they feel comfortable with. Mm-hmm. A lot of these tools do do similar things. Um, so, I mean, it's it's choice. A lot of it comes down to choice, familiarity. Just like when you work with certain people, you know what you're getting out of that person. It's, you know, that might be a reliable person for you to go to. Same thing with these fixtures. They sort of develop good habits and you, you find these little systems and processes that work and you have them as tools in your sort of repertoire. This seems like a good spot to take a break so I can do a few reads for our sponsors. These guys continue to support the show, and I'm more than happy to talk about how awesome they are. First up, Puget Systems. Are you in the market for a new edit system? Tired of every software update making your machine run slower? Do you want a system that runs faster than the three choices that you get from Apple? Then I seriously suggest you look into buying a PC. They are faster and easily upgraded, and Puget Systems support and technical help blows AppleCare out of the water. Go to PugetSystems.com. They have made it easy for you to get started by allowing you to select the software you use and automatically pairing it up with the right computer model for your needs. Seriously, go check them out. PugetSystems.com Azo Monitors. How many of you know what a calibrated monitor is? How many of you have one? Just because you have an Apple Cinema display, it doesn't mean that the colors that you are seeing are true. Azo makes outstanding self-calibrating monitors that come built with the tools to take accurate luminance and color measurements in the room that you're working in. They make sure that when you spend hours tweaking your colors, that they'll look that good on phones, laptops, and even in the theater. At McFarland & Pesci, we just got our hands on their new 4K CG318, and it's awesome. Go to azo.com and spend some of that money you saved on your Puget Systems machine and grab yourself a peace of mind when it comes to color grading. 
Rule Boston Camera. I've said it before and I'll say it again, I love renting equipment from a local rental house. Not only do I always have the latest and greatest gear, but they have my back. If something goes wrong on set, they will hand deliver a replacement. It keeps my clients happy, it keeps my brain happy, it's the only way to shoot. Now if you're on the East Coast, I highly suggest you go hang out with my good buddies at Rule Boston Camera. So we have a new sponsor for this episode, Red Sky Studios. These guys have been long known as the best place to rent lights and grip gear. There's a reason why you see their trucks in every major Hollywood production here in Boston. What a lot of people don't know is that they also have two amazing sound stages right down the street from my office in Alston. It's my favorite place to shoot with a full kitchen, producer rooms, hair and makeup suites, and a giant warehouse full of all the toys you'll ever need. So these guys love to work with indie filmmakers, so don't be afraid to write to Ruben and ask if he can help. Visit redsky-studios.com. I can, the one-stop shop for monitors, camera support, follow focuses, lighting, and more. Are you looking for a great kit for everyday shooting? If so, I would go to iCanCorp.com and take a peek. Tina and I have been using their LED panels and their tripods and their camera support systems for a while. These guys are great, they have awesome prices, and they're really loyal. So go to iCanCorp.com. McFarland and Pesci. Do you want to see all the cool projects that I'm constantly referencing on the show? Are you a big fan of cooking, music, artists, music videos, photography, and more? Then go to McFarlandPesci.com and take a peek around. That's also the best place to reach me if you want to hire me for work. Because we are for hire. So go to McFarlandPesci.com. And or and you walk into a situation knowing I can afford the footprint of this lighting setup that I like, or I can't afford the footprint of this lighting setup that I like. It requires much, to, literally square footage or height. Like I'm never gonna be able to get the light high enough relative to your face and to stay out of the shot. Mm-hmm. Never, mm-hmm. I, I gotta, gotta think of another way to do it. Or, or can I afford to rig something above you and bounce the light? You know, and then what is that gonna do? Which is a, a, a nice transition into this thought. Um, there's a radical difference that I've seen uh, between independent film lighting and even lower than independent, like starting out lighting, and then going on to a big film, like a, and I would say, you know, like a big Judd Apatow kind of type of movie. And, and from the independent level, usually from my experience, it's like how many units can I physically cram behind the camera in that room? And you're usually running around with you know, a half a dozen, a dozen small little units doing this stuff, and it's very crowded, and everybody's stepping over stands, and everybody's stepping over cables, and you feel very sort of sandwiched, and any time you move that camera, it's that process of like, well, we're gonna move all this shit, and everything's gonna move. And then when you show up to like a larger film set, like the sets are almost clean of gear, and it's usually being put in through the outside, and it's being put in through the windows, and then there's such a huge difference between price on that, level where it's like okay i was able to get a sweet deal on all these little packages and all this gear and i have enough light to do my separation i have enough light to get my exposure but there are all these little units and i need more hands and usually the guys are running around sweaty and cut hands (laughs) and bruised and really beaten to shit and then you get on to these larger productions and you're dealing with like the outside of a giant like dance hall and it has like you know a you know, a couple dozen giant units that are outside these windows and then running off of like generators that are running in the background. So it's really intense. But at the end of the day, what is the difference in quality? And and I think this is a, a uh, an issue that I constantly run into when I'm talking to producers and I'm talking to people with the money and people will ask me like, why do you need more guys? And why is it more beneficial for us to have a generator? And why is it more beneficial for us to have all these things? Um, and I... I'm going to ask you this. I don't want to answer that question. What do you think the difference is between... I want to know what you tell them. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, honestly, my response normally is how how fast, how much coverage do you want to get in the day? Honestly. Like, how, many, how much coverage, how many shots do you need? Mm-hmm. 
Um, and from my mind as a, as a, uh, I, I get split as a creative because as a, uh, cinematographer and as a shooter, I want it to look amazing all the fucking time as a director. But then I'm also in the edit room and I'm also an editor and I'm like, I don't give a shit if we spent 45 minutes getting rid of all the reflections on that glass case, I lost five shots for the scene. So I literally have coverage in two shots and I had an actor that isn't delivering their lines correctly and I got this going wrong. So that perfection has ruined this scene and potentially like ruined the movie. Yeah. And so with, with me talking to uh, producers, I'm usually like, how fast, how many cover, how much coverage do you want? Right. And I think that if you buy more and you spend that money on those details that you need ahead of time, the set is a lot more relaxed. The actors are a lot more relaxed. The performances are a lot more rea- relaxed. And that's what you're purchasing. Mm-hmm. And it, does that make sense to you? Yeah, you're you're purchasing that. You're also potentially giving your director and your actors more room to work. Mm-hmm. The, the lighting units can, in general, kind of be further away um, because they're bigger and softer. Um, it it more often than not is like delivering a look. I mean, you said Apatow, so you could high key you could you could just sort of like look at a whole bunch of movies that kind of look like that where they're just they're just really well exposed and but you can also go back in his career a ways and um, look into smaller budget films where they were also still just trying to give the actors and the director room to work and they weren't really trying to light some kind of sublime Mm -hmm. cinematic masterpiece Um, but you have to take into account things like um, what's the what's the destination of this project is it going to be on big screens and and what's the resolution does it have to be? And how much grain do you want or like or not or noise or not like? Yeah, yeah. Um, how much depth of field? Um, how much in focus do you want at any given period of time? Because to get more in focus, you need more light, basically. Generally, you need more light. Um, are you working with sunlight? The sunlight, the sun is basically always going to be the same amount of brightness, more or less. So, uh, if you're working with a lot of sunlight, are you putting ND on the windows to reduce that amount of light th- coming through the windows, or do you have to light the inside up so that there's... Because um, the smaller units really can't compete with the power of the sun at that point, yeah. so you have to bring in light. But maybe units. stylistically you're happy for the windows to blow out and not to have a lot of information. Mm-hmm. You're just, I'm going to embrace that. The windows are going to be bright. We're going to put window dressing. We're going to put sheer in front of them. They're going to blow out, and it is what it is. Or... Oh, you know, we we wrote this script. It's about two houses that are across the street from each other, and we have to be able to see them from the other one all the time. (laughs) And we're going to have actors moving in the background like, okay, well, guess what? Um, You're going to be ending the windows down or you're going to be lighting the interiors up. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's I guess there's those kinds of considerations. And then, yes, how quickly do you want to work? depending on the format that you're shooting in, depending on your aperture and your depth of field. Are we putting marks down for actors? Is the camera on a tripod? Is it moving on a dolly? Is it handheld? Do we get to see the rehearsals? Or is it like literally just kind of like run and gun? Yeah. Um, What's the feel? Um, If we have a lot of time to put down marks and to check our focus and we have our dolly moves and everything's like set up, that's going to require one thing. do you have a rigging team? Do you have a rigging team who can come and do it ahead of time? Rigging, I think, is an interesting thing to talk about because I didn't really know anything about rigging, the rigging positions at all before actually getting in the motion picture industry. Uh, the rigging department is responsible for m- most of the bigger setups that you see or don't see. Um, they allow for the shooting team to and do exactly what you're talking about, sort of do more in a day. Um, with some of the larger setups, they might require, you know, huge units in hard to reach places. And a rigging team will go there and ha- ahead of time and sort of lay everything out and put it in a position where it just the controls are accessible to the shooting team. So it saves them a ton of work on the front end and allows them to get more ground covered. So you have two teams sort of working in tandem mm-hmm. um, with one another um, to sort of cover more ground in a more effective way you know so the rigging team will go in after the shoot and they'll you know strip everything down move on to the next setup um and some of this stuff is pretty mind-blowing like what is what is some of the bigger rigs that you guys have worked on 
Like, were, you, were you on DHT at all? Or? No, I didn't do a daddy's home. Too. They had a gigantic, you know, they had their 158 foot quasars in a gigantic softbox kind of thing that they moved around the set a, a bunch. Yeah. It was on a crane? I, I think they had it on a crane. Yeah. Yeah. With just like huge magic cloth setups and yeah. they're just moving them around i mean that the film takes place in the winter time they're shooting it what in the summertime or right in the fall so on ghostbusters um we did Times square at the weymouth naval air station um by stacking 360 degrees shipping containers and skinning them with green screen Jesus. how many sky panels there and was like, uh, there wasn't uh, there was Skype I think there was a few sky panels that this was 2015. A ton of Kino. Yeah, yeah, lots of Kino. So all the green screen was lit. Green to Kino. Kinos. Because the green screen needs to have a certain exposure to be able to key out correctly. So you're yeah. you have to it's not like you just lay out that green screen and it's good to go. You actually have to light that. You could look out. You could be lucky and it might just you be good. You use green to go. Kinos too for those setups if I recall correctly. Yeah, if you use green Kinos, you get to use less lamps you can use less electricity when you're talking about you know several hundred kinos wow that's that's, that's a up. savings um because you only need the green part of the spectrum so you can use less for the same amount of output and that's nuts now so now you're starting to get into math at this point right when you're starting to get this big and is this something that you do as a gaffer are you processing this math or does this fall in the, the hands of someone else in your department and by math i mean like how much power do i need where am i getting this power from how much power does each one of these units pull and then what are the calculations for that like right. it starts to blow my mind a little yeah bit. i mean on on big movies when there's like established teams of individuals who work together Yes, the rigging gaffer and the rigging best boy are doing a lot of the math to figure out what the gaffer and the DP really want to do. Um, on smaller movies, the gaffer is also sort of double checking yeah, that, right. that math to make sure that it all makes sense. I think and because part of it is they have to sell this the budget of that to through the production because you can just say to the dp oh yeah we'll have like a, a row of 18 k's outside the house and the dp will say that sounds great but then you have to turn to the producer and say i need this much cable i need two generators i need this much manpower we need a day and a half to set it up a day and a half to break it down i'll need an extra truck um, and then you're just prioritizing at that point because you're like, right. what's the scene and what's it about? Yeah. And then as that producer, if you're a good producer, you're actually sitting there prioritizing what the relevance of that scene is to the whole movie and sure. like what the budget is. Yeah. And it's a fucking fascinating thing. It's, I mean, it all compounds too. Like you're constantly running into new roadblocks that are changing your decisions. You see it happening. And it's not just on motion pictures. I mean, you see it on commercial productions all the time, even yeah. smaller productions. I mean, yeah. there's like, it's constantly problem solving now for folks at home that really are sort of don't even think about the math and it, it maybe it kind of scares them if you break it down into a smaller thing if you think about a standard house like a standard home and you're shooting in a home most houses have circuits in that house and then circuits are usually what like 15 amp circuits in a house 15 to 20 amps so like a nice modern suburban house may have a max of like 100 to 200 amps Right. in one service and then apartments in the city may have 60 or 70 amps so then Maybe. At, at that point on a standard 15 to 20 amp circuit how many lights can you run off of that not many yeah, yeah. well it depends what kind of lamps I mean if you see these days it gets really sort of <laughs> crazy because you can run a bunch of maybe what three sky panels off of one 20 amp circuit yeah maybe, maybe four maybe four i think they're probably draw about 400 amps and you know uh, within, watts, within which is four amps 20 to 30 feet you're getting maybe between a 1.2 and maybe like a 1.2 equivalent hmi light you know where you can only plug one of those in a fixture right, <laughs> right. and these sky panels are new airy fixtures that are led based at this point so they, yeah i they mean draw less power very popular lights very versatile they have a you know broad range of applications and yeah. so on but i mean it, it really just depends on what type of fixture even fluorescence will draw less power than like a 1k fresnel yeah. clearly a 1k fresnel draws a thousand watts yeah. right but uh, and HMIs actually are more efficient than incandescent, so it would be a reason to potentially use HMIs. So really? For, for, so for the same wattage, you get, I think, uh, one punch. and a half times the brightness or something like that. Yeah. I should know the answer to that question. <laughs> but it, it, it is sizable. Yeah, yeah. And, and Okay, so then 
um, if you're just someone shooting at home, then you have to sort of process, okay, how many different circuits do I have? How many different lights can I use? Mm -hmm. And then where are these lights going? And then that sort of stems back to that indie level where you're like, okay, I am now restricted by mm -hmm. this. And I remember breaking out of that indie level as a young filmmaker and going from like an airy kit at the time and maybe, maybe an HMI, but you know, Delphi, maybe like an 800 or something. And then, uh, saying, okay, now I'm doing a film that requires me to light a hallway, or requires me to light a larger space, so what are my next choices? And then you're dealing with your producer who's like, I have no fucking money, and you're like, okay. <laughs> so then you're- That's how it always is. Then you're, my next step was the tie-in game, where you're actually doing tie-ins, where you're you know, breaking, or, or not breaking, you're actually tying into the, 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 the electrical box that comes from the street to pull more power specifically out of that electrical box. And then that is a very dangerous sort of thing because you're asking an electrician to basically tie into the power of this place. And I learned very early on that I hated that and that was probably one of the last things I wanted to do. Um, and so then your only next option at that point is to deal with generators, correct? Right. But we should just, just very quickly about tie-ins. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Don't ever do a tie-in unless you're a licensed electrician. Yeah, do not <laughs> do a tie-in unless you're a licensed electrician. Yeah, yes. That's um, a very quick way to... Hurt, hurt yourself very yeah. badly. Yeah. I don't do any of this unless you're... No, I'm just kidding. There are all these phrases that are dangerous, dangerous phrases in the that you hear regularly in the film industry, these sort of like whatever it takes kind yeah. of phrases. Yeah. You can probably spout some of them out. I'll do whatever it takes. You know, I've never been to this house before. Oh my God, we, have, we haven't scouted this. We need to set up this light. This light is the only way that it'll work. <laughs> All right, well, whatever it takes, I'm gonna go, op I'm not a licensed electrician, I'm gonna go open up a service and clamp or do something, you know, really dangerous. No, don't do that. Don't, I've, don't I've, do that. I've seen the Trust results. I've seen, I'm sure you guys have too. I've seen the yeah. results of the danger. And w when you're on a film set, it's stressful as it is. And usually for whoever's running that film set, to them it's the end of the fucking world. Like well, it always seems like, if I don't pull this off, then my life is over and like everything's gonna crumble. And that stress sort of runs rampant yeah. on small, small, small productions, not on all film on, productions. On any set though, I mean, if you're connecting any sort of electricity, you really are responsible for the guys that you're working with and you, you should not put yourself or anyone else in danger in that. Yeah. <laughs> and we do lots of tie-ins on major motion pictures and they're done by licensed electricians. Yeah. Right. Um, we'll, we'll be working in a, uh, a warehouse because we don't have a lot of studio spaces here and you need to have power all around that warehouse for the construction department and the props department and uh, locations and air conditioning and whatever. So you're like, I need 150 amp service here. I need 150 amp service there. I need 150 amp service there. Put in a transformer here. We'll go from 480 down to 208. Like that's like a regular thing. Or I'm working in a, um, a sky ride, a, a um, skyscraper. And um, there's no way that I'm going to run, you know, 30, <laughs> 30 flights of cable from a generator. Yeah, yeah. What can they give us? Oh, they can give us 200 amps. We can make do with that. So we'll have a tie-in put in. A million ways to do similar things, though. I mean, it just sort of depends on what you're trying to achieve. Um, but I like just talking about these options because a lot of people don't think about this stuff. Yeah, but now even batteries. You can achieve yeah. so much with batteries. Like there are grip tricks batteries and things of which are, that, which are expensive. Which are really expensive, and there are a couple of different versions of them. But you have batteries now that can power 2K sources for four or five hours at a time you know, with an inverter. And that, that provides a huge amount of flexibility for these guys because in a, in a situation like, you know, if they're doing a car setup, then they can set up a couple of batteries out of the trunk with no emissions and be running, you know, f five to ten heads for hours at a time. Um, that saves a tremendous amount of time. Um, but it is a little bit, there's, it's a little more costly sometimes because those batteries are so expensive. So there's always a sort of give and take with how you, what you need to sort of achieve something. Uh, those conversations happen all the time where suddenly the producer has like a, you know, come to Jesus moment and they realize in order to actually power all of these different light sources, we're going to have to bring in a bunch of cable and that means more manpower and that means generators and that means teamsters to drive generators. And that means, you know, like the, in order to get one thing, you sort of have to get a whole bunch of other right, things when you start moving in that scale, yeah, yeah. you know, but there are different ways of achieving a similar look with, you know, small adjustments maybe, you know, instead of seeing the window, you shift two feet to the left and 
you just <laughs> saved ten thousand dollars. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a fascinating. That thought. happens all the time. But it's a fascinating thought process because a majority of people that watch movies really don't put one and two together as far as how budgets inflate. And I think that you know, there's a lot of, well, the actor just got fucking millions and millions of dollars on this thing, and you're sitting there going, no, 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 no. Actually, that epic wide shot where it's raining at night and we can see all these like uh, road to perdition you know what i mean and you can see all of these guys shooting at each other and firing at each other down this down this street <laughs> in high speed yeah and, and you, <laughs> that's when it starts to get really yeah, crazy and then you sit there and you go okay you start doing the fucking math on that you're like holy shit all right so how they get the rain towers and what do they deal with the rain towers in that whole department and then to get that high speed in order to shoot super slow motion you need much more light. Oh, yeah. You need much more light in order to get that exposure. Mm -hmm. So then you're increasing the size of all those units that you're using, yeah. which is then increasing the, the, the power that you're drawing for all those different things. So where's the power coming from? And then you're talking about cable and you're talking about the guys that are running that cable. Mm -hmm. And you can literally shoot a scene that way or shoot the scene in a Michael Mann slash, you know, Miami Vice kind of way where he's like, crank the gain do this sort of stuff and I'm just going to use we'll swap out these lights in the streets here for practicals and we'll do the same sort of scene out here with all the, without all that stuff so yeah. just stylistically that subtle decision to make that move has exponentially blown the budget up for that one scene which is really cool A1 but also I think that when folks are watching movies and they go well, I don't understand why this movie costs like you know 150 million dollars it's like asshole that's not Times Square that's like you know how many fucking you know trailer truck backs that are stacked on top of each other and there's literally two cranes cranes that are carrying the light and moving the light in different positions for you who's operating those cranes who's putting those cranes where they are and like and then you start to see it all sort of tethered down yeah. which is when you're writing a script and you're like stands in the road and there's right. guys with Tommy guns and it's raining outside. You know what I mean? <laughs> you're just like, this is going to be epic. You know, like I, I'm, I'm doing that right now with my script and I'm like, there's a part that happens in the back of a cargo plane and it's written for the day. I'm like, what if it's a night and there's raining outside? <laughs> it's really cool. Cause it's like Kurosawa and you have all that written and then you go, this is never going to happen. <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, it's really cool. I think it's a really fun kind of nerdy thing that is interesting to talk about. So, mm -hmm. Sometimes you're surprised by the scale of some of these productions. Like I remember when I was just starting uh, with the Boston motion picture industry here, there was a movie that they were doing and they had to replace every single street light, you know, because it was a time piece. Uh, mm -hmm. So they literally went into that town pulled up all the street lights or replaced the heads on all the street lights replaced them so with that like, they weren't LEDs so that they weren't LEDs and they were like 1980s style fixtures you know <laughs> yeah. and yeah. you know replaced them all along the same token they might have a movie like The Fighter where uh, there were no LEDs but there were warm colored sodium vapor street lights and they wanted the streets to be cool they wanted them to be sort of neutral colored Jesus. so we had to figure out a way to put um metal halide bulbs in sodium vapor fixtures which is like a crazy equation of um voltages and chemistry and things like that but it's like ballast adjustment yeah me, but meanwhile it all comes from the top it goes i just want it all to be nice and cool yeah no there. it makes sense even bridges you guys have rewrapped bridges with fluorescent tubes and yeah. just for drive-by night shots and that kind of thing is always pretty wild yeah. But a lot of it goes into the consideration of this stuff, you know? You can't have a 1980s style film with LED streetlights. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. <laughs> but then, you know what, as we're talking at the top of the chain at this point, and we're talking at, you know, the millions and millions of dollar budget that can support these things, you're still at that level falling back on the skills that you've taught yourself literally with taking the lampshade off of a light and moving that thing around, correct? You're still using the same bare essentials of that, which I think is interesting. I mean, and, and at that point, when you're uh, sort of in charge of that, if you were a DP, and, and if you, are, like even as a director, like there's a point where it's like, I just don't want to know about the equation. I don't care about any of that stuff because it's just way too much mm -hmm. for you to process. And it's like, I just want to be out in the rain. I want to be out there with the Tommy guns and you guys need to figure that stuff out. Mm -hmm. And so there hits this point where 
there's such a great value in these positions. There's such a great value in the gaffing position. There's such a great value in the electrics position because not only are those folks in love with film and not only are those folks in love with story, but they've compartmentalized that passion that they have for light or the quality of light. And then they have processed all those tools that as a director I would need, but without me having to know about that stuff, which is interesting. You know what I mean? And right. I think that's the power of film. I think that's the power of film sets. And when you look at these long credit lists and you're looking at, you know, you know, sound technicians and you're looking at like, you know, anybody from like transportation department straight on or someone that's in involved with locations, that's what happens. You have this idea which doesn't exist in reality. You know what I mean? Like yeah. there isn't Wolverine running around with claws and fucking stabbing people. And you're you're trying to make that work for real. And and to a certain extent, you have to at least create a portion of that in the real world. You have to create the idea of a guy flying through the fucking air and someone's on these cables and they're suspending him and they're doing all that sort of stuff. And so these ideas at the beginning where I'm told, don't restrict your thought, write whatever it is that you want to write, write your story, write your shit, don't think about the logistics, just sort of put that together. It's so wild to think that like somebody else has to like figure out like, all right, how the fuck do I make this guy fly? And how the fuck do I, you know, like how, how do I, I make sure we can see the rain? Yeah, yeah, yeah. like all the way oh, down shit. to that specific. The, the rain isn't backlit properly. Yeah, the director is going to be standing there looking in the monitor, saying, "I can't see the fucking rain. <laughs> They're wet. <laughs> They're splashing around in these puddles. Why can't I see the fucking rain? Uh, we could not afford a condor and a backlight." <laughs> well, what the fuck are you going to do? Um, we make a slightly less wide shot. <laughs> Sorry. And we try to hide some backlight on the ground over here. <laughs> Maybe. Be yeah. below, the, below the shot somehow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. I mean, it's so cool, though. I mean, ultimately, let's, I really love I know you love it. I can tell you love it. And I know you kind of like this business still. I love this business. You know, it's and beautiful. Like, and Dave's just getting into it. So mm -hmm. um, there's something. It's it's so cool. It's a very cool thing to be able to not only play make believe, but also hang out with your buddies that are like, I can build anything. You know what I mean? Like, there's a whole grip department that's like, I got to put that fucking crane on an old dock. All right, cool. Let's figure out how to reinforce that shit, and let's figure out how to construct this sort of thing. And you're like, holy shit! It's like yeah, such a magical <clears throat> business. Yeah, and even in like small ball small baseball light lighting yep. to work with a grip department a lighting and a grip department that like really work well together you know it's the light goes up gets flags on either side maybe gets a flag topper you know gets softened it's just all of these elements kind of go in almost without you even having to talk about it because the grip is standing there he's seen you uh, illuminate the actor and he also noticed that you illuminated the wall behind the actor inadvertently so he better take the light off the wall so there's nice separation you know and they're just like they're just doing it they're just flowing it mm -hmm. or um, you realize the light isn't soft enough so you take it upon yourself to move the light back a little bit to give them room on the edge of the frame to diffuse the light appropriately you know because you were playing it so close there was no room for the grips to do their job so there's this whole flow back and forth between the departments that is very exciting okay so let me put you on the spot here we go i've been on the spot for like an hour and a half <laughs> let me put so okay we're going to shoot a scene we're going to shoot a scene in here right and i wanted to, the scene basically is uh an old man sitting on a porch uh on the cape and it's uh late it's it's like july probably 7 30 ish the sun is setting behind him it's supposed to be a warm summer day and we can see like bugs in the air around him and all this sort of stuff. And we built a porch on the set here. <laughs> we built the porch on the, in the studio here. Um, how would you, how would you create that sun? How would you, with budgets, budgets aside, no budgets needed. Like what would you, how would you start for that sun? I love this. <laughs> He's like, fuck you. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Are you shooting any high speed? No, no, no. Regular yeah. speed, regular speed. We're probably using Alexa. You know, we can yeah. be at uh, eight hundred if you want. We yeah. can be, you know. Wow. Well, my my. Well, the first thing I would do, um, I I would probably default to using um, tungsten light, even though like I think probably a lot of people that I work with would 
maybe use LED light because they could probably get it bright enough or they would use HMI light because HMI light is daylight colored. But um, I really like tungsten light um, mm -hmm. because of its, of its color information. And that tungsten is a very warm source. Naturally. It's warm, it's clean. When you're white balanced to it, you know, um, it's just, I don't know, there's a certain energy to a certain wavelength to it. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, I mean, it really depends on the shot. So you're like telling me this shot and I'm superimposing um, Henry Fonda in Once Upon a Time in the West. He's sitting at a train station and he's having an issue with a fly and he's considering ca catching that fly with the barrel of his gun, but it's just like really hot. And, um, you know, I think they were probably doing like a three quarter backlight with um, arcs, arc lights, which were like a predecessor of HMI lights um, that used like rods of actual carbon and sending direct current through them so that it would arc through this it's gas. Very and, safe stuff. Uh, <laughs> lot, lots of smoke was involved. Um, the lights actually had smoke stacks. Anyway, um, I don't know. Like to me, as often as is possible when you're trying to. Um, do daylight, uh, you want to just sort of stay with one simple source of light mm -hmm. so that like all the shadows work, the texture works. So, you know, I might take, if I could afford it, I might take like a 12K or a 20K Fresnel incandescent light and um, back it up a great deal, um, three quarters behind him. So we're seeing him in profile. The near side of his face is relatively down um, and then probably just like return it back into his face, have the grips return it back into his face with a, a 12 by of uh, unbleached muslin, which is like a warm cotton material as sort of a nice low note. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You say return, you mean bounce. Bounce. Yeah, we use all this weird lingo that just sort of comes up and we just kind of know what we mean. Do you want to do a return here? It means do you want to have the light return back into the shot here? And what he means is that the light would be coming from over three quarters the behind the actor and then bouncing from the front of the actor into the actor. You know? And if you were looking in a real life situation, then that if the sun was behind you at that point, then potentially it's bouncing off of a wall or potentially it's bouncing off the floor in front of you. Yep. And you get like that sort of warm yep. register. Yeah. It's bouncing up off the porch. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you have to recreate that in one way or another to have control over that. Yeah. But then, you know, I just, I think it goes back to, well, what is the shot? So are we seeing a lot of real estate that's like the house? And what's the, what's that color tone? Mm -hmm. As the, is the, the shingles or the clapboard or whatever, the material actually asking to be lit from higher up? Um, because you just don't like the way that the light reacts to those, to those pieces? Yeah, maybe. Um, well, they're in the shot. They're in the shot, so they have they have their own tone, yeah, and yeah. they're working with the tone of our guy, the foreground element. Um, so they they probably want to probably be less bright, relatively speaking. Yep. Um, or the same value of brightness, not probably not too bright. They don't want to make us squint or make the actor squint. Yeah. I I don't know. I think like lighting can ultimately be very simple, and especially when you say, well, that's a sunlit late afternoon on the porch well let's let's set up a light and then let's take away the parts of the light or like add a little contrast where we don't like it bouncing because we're in a white room here so it's going to be bouncing everywhere the contrast will not be right yeah yeah um so let's put black on the floor um maybe we actually need to fly white up maybe we want to put bleached muslin or we want to put a 20 by of like a sky blue color above the set so that we're bouncing light up so that there is like a diffuse Overhead, slightly kinda. cool overhead lighting feel because mm -hmm. we're in a studio. It's black, so that we're not going to feel like the light coming from everywhere because it would be coming from everywhere, even though that has the directionality of the sun. Right, right, right. That's cool. I don't know. It's just like no, that's good. And then it's just like looking to it and then responding to it as quickly as possible. Honestly, yeah. you're looking at it and you're like, why isn't this working? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. well, I have to come up with something quickly. Yeah. Or, fuck, I blew it. But on this coverage, I'm going to come around. I'm going to make it a little bit better. Right, because I'm, I'm, I'm out of time, and I can't really fuck with it at this point. And that's reality. There's so many times that that actually happens. And then also, that's a sign of experience where you can actually sit there and go, okay, I'm done. 
Like if, if you can see beyond your own little world and, and you can see beyond your own problems and actually see it on such a larger scale and go, yep. I'm not necessarily 100% happy with this, but we got to move on. So let's move on and then, you know, I'll make up for it later. Yeah. You know, and like, how long is this shot going to be in the film? Oh, three seconds. Yeah, it's fine. Let's go. You know what yeah. I mean? And then you're, you're on to the next thing, yeah. which is cool. And then maybe we might, maybe we'll take that one light source and we'll diffuse it as close as we can to the action with like the absolute lightest diffusion we can put there. So just off the shot. So the light source is really far away so that the illumination is even. There's very little fall off. Yeah, yeah. The shadows are strong, the contrast is present, but then just off the shot, we're gonna put the lightest amount of diffusion, which is just gonna like open it up. It's gonna wrap it just very slightly around its, fa around its face, but it's gonna maintain the sort of quality of light, the directionality of light. We're not gonna like over diffuse it, so suddenly it's like, right? is it like a, there's a cloud in front of this guy? <laughs> yeah. It's gonna be like something very soft. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I love that stuff, man. And, and without getting too far into it, because we're running low on time, without getting too far into it, like I love, the little tricks that people have for for bounce lighting and for that like there's so many little tricks of the trade i mean i've heard about like richardson's tricks that he does and how many layers of diffusion and how he bounces like he'll literally take a light and set it up facing the wrong direction and it's not even facing the subject right. and then it's bouncing off of something that then is going through like different levels of diffusion to give you that specific look um it's really wonderful to watch and it like if you are in love with lighting you know there are places i mean there are very few places that you can look for it like american cinematographer you can kind of go through and see some of their setups but you kind of need to know what the technical terms are most of the time you're looking at maps or you're sort of glancing around but it's I, i'm happy that it is one of those uh trades that is sort of apprenticeship based and you kind of get in younger and you sort of work your way through you can learn about that but when you see it done it's such a fucking amazing thing to watch how people will take a set of tools that they're required to decide what they need ahead of time. Look at a script and go, this is, I, I think we can do this. And then they turn to uh, someone and they go, well, you can afford half of that. And you go, oh, I think I can do it with this sort of thing. Ruben knows that I generally order twice as much or more <laughs> than I need. And then I'm faced with reality and having to <laughs> dial it all back. Dial it all back <laughs> simply because I can't truck it from A to B. <laughs> but then you well, you want options. I mean, for you, it's like why wouldn't you want all these options to be able to effectively do? Because sometimes you never, you know, you don't know what you're walking into. You can walk into a right. production that you haven't tech scouted, or you're totally walking in with no information at all. Somebody said there's a window. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and sometimes that's all it is. That's all the information you get. You know, and but, then you're stuck with those tools. And then you, and then to watch people that are really confident in their craft to sit there and go, I know what I got. I know I got the essentials of what I need. It's like cooking a meal again. I know I have the bits and pieces that I need to make this this dish. Let's get to work. And that's such a beautiful thing to watch. And and being someone that is a shooter and, and that I'll sit there at the monitor, or I'll sit there and I'll watch the lighting team go to work. It always fascinates me because usually my direction is like, hey, here's where I think the key's coming from. Here's the kind of light that I like. You know, and here's the contrast range that I want to have happen. Right. And then you just sit back and you watch. And and if you're in that position where we're just talking about lighting department here, like you start dealing with camera movement, you start dealing with camera department, you start dealing with sound, you start dealing with production design. Production design always blows my fucking mind. The way that these people can pull these things together for no money is insane. To me. <laughs> for no money. Yeah, you know, and to see how that stuff comes together. So. I think filmmaking in general is such a, it's still very much a magical thing that is very physical. It's still very much a physical thing. There isn't an app that you can do that's like your gaffer app where you're like, I got this film, here's my script, gaffer app, you know, and it gives you sort of like the printout list of exactly what it is that you need to do and where you place this stuff. It doesn't exist yet, yet. Um, so it's still a really fun and magical thing and I'm happy. I think I should probably wrap it up. I, like, I'm happy that I was able to sit here and talk to you guys. I, we could sit here and talk for four hours, but I know you got stuff to do, and no one's going to listen to this fucking thing for four hours. <laughs> so, so thank you so much, guys. Um, Ruben, let's start with you. Uh, do you want to plug? Do you want to talk about why, why should the young filmmakers come see you guys here at Red Sky? I mean, at Red Sky, obviously, we have all the tools that we've been talking about all day, um, but we also do sort of like sinking our teeth into new and creative applications of some of the tools that we've talked about and also creating and designing new tools. I mean, that sort of gets into the fun part of it where you're, you're, you're sort of aware of what 
is available to you. And like, f- for instance, some of the bow stuff that we worked on, um, mm-hmm. we had a light that was perfect for that application because there was a relatively shallow ceiling height. So we needed a good amount of flexibility with a lot of power. And so, we couldn't we couldn't rig to the ceiling. And we couldn't rig to the ceiling. There was nothing to rig to. So we developed like really lightweight, bright tools to be able to do that and you know um, we have access to those tools not to say that those are the only tools that people should use I think any young new filmmaker mess around try to you know go to the hardware store go buy some sockets go buy a fluorescent fixture see what it does see how light you know, either makes your shot better or worse or your production better or worse. You don't need to go buy a $10,000 HMI um, to mess around with this stuff. I think it's really important. If there's something that you're interested in, just do it. You know, everybody has access. Turn the lights off <laughs> <laughs> and then start over. Bring yeah. in some lights and see what it does. You know, uh, I think Red Sky obviously has a ton of these tools available and if you need anything feel free to reach out we'll be happy to talk you through some of the options yep you guys have been wonderful you guys have been wonderful to me you guys are a fantastic resource for the city so cool, I man. appreciate it man happy to help and then uh josh you got anything you want to plug you want to talk about anything you're doing right now uh i do do i pierre menard oh pierre menard <laughs> i'm part of a um organization called pierre menard and company Oh. which is like a creative agency. Um, we have a, uh, a roster of cinematographers who have backgrounds in uh, gaffing and camera assisting and who are trying to develop their career. So what's important is that um, we're trying to support each other through sort of a peer-to-peer mentorship. That's awesome. And um, a sharing of resources and um, a, a curating a little bit of the kinds of projects. It's not just like a, it could be called a production company, but um, we don't want to just sort of do whatever comes down the pike. Hmm. So yeah, it's a new thing and it's developing and evolving and it's sort of a living organism. And um, currently it's me and a couple other young DPs who've been doing this for anywhere from five to, 20 years <laughs> and uh, we're probably looking for more collaborators and um, yeah very cool yeah. I'll find uh, out all the information from you guys and make sure that we have links and stuff listed what's up Ruben? I want to say something else. I want to redo my Red Sky one if that's cool <laughs> <laughs> Only because, and I not, want to, redo and not, my to, and not to shamelessly plug it, but I, I would like to open up the door as like a resource in Boston for anybody who has questions regarding this stuff. Like you said, it can be intimidating for people. It doesn't hurt to send an email. You know what I mean? Shoot us an email. Ask us a question. If we can help answer your question, no, no problem is like too small. Like we work on a bunch of productions. They range from really small to really big, and that shouldn't intimidate people to reach out if they have questions. Don't do anything unsafe. That, that's kind of like what I want to say. That's good. Is that cool? Yeah, we'll leave them both in there. I think All right. I think it's, it's done. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going back to work. Do we need to wrap it up? I'm going to wrap it up right now. <laughs> All right, Dave, do you have anything you want to throw in there? Are you good? No, I think we got a whole podcast about that stuff, so we're All good. Right. All right, sounds good. Well, thank you guys for listening. I hope that uh, you learned a little bit uh, something about lighting, and then uh, for those of you who have been afraid of it, um, there is really nothing to be afraid of. Uh, you start at the beginning, and then uh, you can figure all this stuff out. And as uh, you've learned through this episode, there are plenty of resources. And uh, we are East Coast-based, so Red Sky is out here in Boston. Um, but I know that you can find these places anywhere in the country. And if you are really interested in lighting, um, maybe what you might want to try doing is getting yourself onto a film as a PA and just sort of bugging and hanging out with the lighting department and watching how it all comes together. So uh, thanks for listening, and uh, we'll see you next time. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode as much as I did. I can't believe how fast it went by. I definitely think we could do a second episode and get even more specific into lighting techniques. What do you guys think? Are there other aspects of lighting that you want to know more about? Were there specific questions that I didn't ask? Head on over to the In Love With The Process Facebook page and leave us a note. Let me know what you're thinking. You can also visit me on Instagram at MikePetchy. Come say hello and I'll say hi back. I promise. And it won't be some emoji. It'll actually be me saying hello. I'll type it out. 
hello. <laughs> Remember to share this episode. Put it on your Facebook page. Put it on your Instagram. Title it, The Coolest Look Into Lighting That I've Ever Heard. Maybe you could even write a description like, Mike and Dave are fucking amazing, sexy dudes that you should follow and like everything they do. <laughs> or maybe not. Uh, so I really appreciate it, guys. Thanks for listening, and uh, hopefully we'll have more episodes just like this one coming at you soon. Bye.